Hey, hey there, business owner. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Evolution Podcast. This is our weekly episode, and I'm so happy you are here. Let's get started. Hi there, entrepreneur. This is your host, Annette Walter. Welcome to this week's Entrepreneur Evolution Podcast. This is the place where we share stories of entrepreneurs just like yourself that are evolving, making an impact in the community, and growing their teams and growing their families. Today, I'm joined by Thibaut Mannequin. He leads with purpose, he leads with passion, and he's made a huge impact through all of the work that he's done starting right out of college on the global scale. He's a partner at Seawall Development, which is a real estate firm that builds environments and empowers communities to unite cities and help launch powerful ideas. Most recently, he launched a podcast called Larger Than Yourself, which is a collaborative space for brave people to share how they are helping small ideas become powerful movements. He's on a mission to amplify the impact of their stories and inspire the courage in others to reimagine industries, lead with purpose, and challenge the status quo. In 2021, he actually is releasing the book, Larger Than Yourself. You are going to love today's interview. You are going to learn so much from his perspective, from how he leads, and I know you will really enjoy today's episode. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all of your support, and thank you for supporting other entrepreneurs just like yourself. Enjoy this episode. Keep evolving. Welcome to the podcast, Tebow. I'm so excited you are here. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. It's amazing to be here. Thank you so much for hosting. Oh, I'm really, I'm really glad you're here. Where are you joining us from today? I have been trying to keep that a bit of a secret, but we are in Brazil this year. My wife is from a tiny island here, and two years ago, she pulled me aside and said, you know, we've been living in Baltimore for uh, the last 13 years. I left my tropical island to marry you and mm-hmm. have fallen in love with the city of Baltimore, but I want our children, we've got a nine-year-old boy and an 11-year-old boy, I want Mm -hmm. our children to experience the world. I want our children to get to know my side of of the family. I want my children to get out of their comfort zones and Mm -hmm. um, go to school in a place where they don't necessarily speak the language fluently. And so all of this was in the works for a couple of years. And we got on a plane at the end of February of this year Mm. and we landed and started to set up roots. And a week later, COVID hit. Mm. So a little bit of my claim to fame is I feel like I was one of the first people to figure out Zoom. Um, I was completely dialed in to work remotely for the year and come back and forth every couple months or so. And the beauty of it is that everybody's been working remotely. So a little bit of that guilt that I've carried about leaving Baltimore for a year um, has subsided since nobody's moving around the way that they used to. Absolutely. Well, and you know, there are so many gifts that had come out of COVID and are still continuing as, as challenging as it has been as of a year for, for all of us and for so many business owners, especially. But if you were going to ever pick a year to do it, wow, what a great, great time to do it. So give us the backdrop, fill us in, you know, catch us up to speed, kind of your cliff notes version of your, your life story of, of how you got here. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the seawall and larger than yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I grew up in Baltimore, uh, mm-hmm. born and raised and went off for college. And when I graduated, I had this amazing opportunity to hook up with two friends to launch a nonprofit organization called Peace Players. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that we would go to war-torn countries, deeply divided countries, and we would use sports to get kids from two sides of a conflict, meet each other, find in common ground, and over time, hopefully becoming friends. Mm-hmm. Kind of like 22 at the time, mm-hmm. I had no idea what we were doing. We just loved sports and I had always known in my heart, I grew up playing sports, that they have this amazing ability to, to bring people together. All, mm-hmm. At that point, all of my friends in life were folks that I'd kids, you know, kids that I'd played sports with. Right. So we raised, I don't know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars from friends and family to start the nonprofit. It felt like a million dollars at that age. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but it was kind of enough to join my buddy Sean in South Africa, um, where we were just after apartheid. And um the idea of getting black kids and white kids playing hoops together. Mm. And so we showed up there and we're um the program starts to pick up immediate success. Um, We start, we're in the black townships, we're in the white suburbs, we're getting these kids mixing together through sports. Um, And 
I don't know, we're kind of like three months into it. We begin to run out of money. Uh, Sean's brother, Brendan, was at home fundraising for us. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, the, it was really tight in those early days. And mm -hmm. I'll, never, I'll never forget this one morning, the phone rings, and it's Nelson Mandela's foundation. Wow. And Nelson Mandela's foundation calls and says, Nelson, I'm a huge, President Mandela is an enormous believer of the power of sports to unite. Oh, wow. And he wants to become your largest uh, sponsor, donor. And so I'm like sitting down to not pass out and, and right. the, with, with this call. Um, and it wasn't Mandela's money that was the most significant, right? It was a huge chunk that was the sort of the beginning of the fundraising efforts in this country. But it really like began to propel us forward. Um, and it gave us this credibility behind us that mm. now we were really here. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that led us to uh, replicating the model all over the world. Wow. Um, we, were, we had already been running a program in Northern Ireland with Protestant Catholic kids, and we'd been running a, we began to run a program in the Middle East with Israeli and Palestinian kids, and we, were in, we moved to Cyprus with Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. So for like six years, I, I lived this fascinating life. I had like a backpack and a surfboard, and we were bouncing around from country to country. And what we were really clear was that it wasn't our idea, right? This concept of sports to unite. It had always existed, been sitting on the tip of the universe's tongue. And for thousands of years, since like people existed and played sports, it brought them together. Um, and so our job wasn't to go show up to these countries and say, as a couple of white guys, we've got the solution to end generations of, of division and separation and hatred and war. Our job is to show up and listen mm. um, and empower the local communities. You know, we started to recruit these coaches and train them. Mm -hmm. We didn't stop calling them coaches. We started calling them change agents, right? Because wow. they were given this power um, to not only teach the sport of basketball, but to literally change lives. Um, and so lived this fascinating life, uh, and for six years ended up coming back to Baltimore. I'd come back to visit for Christmas, uh, to check in with friends and family. And then I'd get back on the plane to wherever we were, uh, we were working at the time. And I remember this one day that the plane landed and something felt off, you know, mm -hmm. and I ended up back out at my parents' house to, for dinner and ended up sleeping out there and mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep. And I woke up early the next morning um, or got out of bed early the next morning. I just got in my car and I just drove into Baltimore City. Um, and I pulled over on the side of the road of Pennsylvania North Avenue, mm -hmm. which is the intersection that, this was in 2006. This is the intersection that about nine years later would okay. be the epicenter of the Freddie Gray uprising. Mm -hmm. um, and I obviously had no idea at the time but the sense that I was feeling in my heart was that Baltimore and America, but specifically Baltimore, my city, was mm -hmm. more divided than any of these other so-called war-torn cities and countries that I'd spent so much time and energy and passion and love in. Mm -hmm. um, and that if we had this inability as Americans to talk about the like, things that kept us apart. Mm -hmm. in real raw honest ways the way that you could talk in south africa the way you could talk in the middle east the way you can talk in northern ireland um and i'm sitting here on this intersection not knowing how i got there like almost like blindly like pulled my car over got out and i just started walking um and this is a neighborhood that my entire life i've been told i don't belong in that i won't be safe in that i shouldn't spend time in um but what I had learned through all of my travels is that that's not the right language, right? Like we have to be able to get out of our comfort zones. We have to be able to walk in other people's shoes. Um, and uh, so I'm walking through this community and I really have this epiphany, right? And it's that, that I'm right that Baltimore is more divided than, than all these other places that I've spent so much time. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that starts to come to me is that real estate, which is, the industry that my family was in when I was growing up that I wanted nothing to do with, that I actually right. hated, right? Mm -hmm. It pulled my dad away from me. Um, it felt like it was completely like profit driven, mm -hmm. um, but that real estate was the most powerful connected industry on the planet. Mm -hmm. That um, if you think about it, it touches every single one of us, every single moment of every single day, Absolutely. the homes that we're in, the offices that we work in, the streets that we drive on, the malls that we shop in, they're mm -hmm. all, carefully planned out by the people that control and own the land. Uh -huh. um, and so I had this kind of like a, a epiphany that even though it was the most connected industry on the planet uh, and the most powerful industry, it had done more to divide us than actually bring us together. Uh -huh.
So I got back in my car um, and I started taking notes um, and I went and, and talked to my dad, who's just a, a hero of mine and of so many people um, mm. and said, dad, um, let's launch a real estate company, but let's launch a company that reimagines the real estate industry altogether. A company that empowers communities to get what it is that they want out of their buildings, a company that unites cities through the work and the projects that they bring to life and a company that helps to launch like really powerful ideas that'll make our cities more connected, more united, um, better places. Uh, and so that was the beginning of the company Seawall, um, okay. which we're working on now. I guess it's been about 14 years at this point. I was going to say, what year are we now? Yeah, so uh, uh, so we launched, so I got back in 2006 from the, the travels and mm -hmm. we launched Seawall, I think in 2007. And mm -hmm. Interesting time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we launched it right at the beginning of, we literally closed financing on our first project the week before Lehman Brothers collapsed. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> right. Like, right as the Great Recession came, which was amazing. We couldn't have put, picked a better time to, to, to get into this work. Um, so I think it's been about 13, 14 years and happy to talk about it, any of the projects or the work that we've done. But Absolutely. I've, I've, well, I, that story alone, I mean, I can just tell you, I just got chills like three times. And, you know, it's interesting. Baltimore is, we always joke around that it's like the rubber band state, you know, everyone who grows up here, they leave, but they somehow end up coming back. It's because, you know, obviously it's a, a deeply connected community. Um, but to have that that day and that moment where you were just woke up and then drove and this and it hit you, it all hit you like everything that you had experienced in your travel, and then the purpose of your past and your family history, it really all collided in such a epic way. That's awesome. Yeah. So so take us in those first couple years recession. Uh, I. That was when I was had just started my former company, a real estate, a residential real estate firm. So I feel and remember all of your pain. Um, so walk me through that. How did the first project get going, and what did you learn the most in those first few years of Seawall? So the concept behind Seawall was that nothing we would ever do would be our idea, right? Okay. We would be driven by what the communities that we were going to work in wanted out mm -hmm. of buildings. Uh -huh. And we were going to be driven by what we call the end users, the people who were going to be living and working in the buildings. Uh -huh. And for us, our passion, mostly through my dad and his work around education, uh -huh. but mine too, was around those people who were working with kids, um, whether they be educators and teachers or right. nonprofits who are running important programs that support the school system. So we had been listening to all of these teachers for so many years who were telling us that they were showing up to Baltimore for the first time and weren't able to figure out the, the community. They had like five days to figure out where their bank was going to be, what gym they were going to go to, where they were going to live, um, who they were going to live with, uh, what school they were going to teach at. And it was an overwhelming decision in the new city. So they were getting thrown into arguably the hardest job on the planet, uh, mm. teaching in our inner cities. Um, and they were getting burnt out during the day and then they were moving to, and then they were going home in the evening to less than ideal circumstances, right? Um, and then they were getting burnt out at night because it took 30 minutes to find a parking spot mm. um, or the person that they lived with um, wasn't calibrated the same way, didn't have the same kind of day. And so all these teachers started to say, hey, it'd be really neat if there was a building for teachers. Wow. So when we showed up to Baltimore for the first time, um, uh, we knew that we had a safe landing place, like a cool, funky building where the rents were affordable and where we could collaborate and cry together and share ideas and laugh together. And so we were just taking notes, you know, like this sounds amazing. Why wouldn't every city in the world have a teacher, have a building that rolled out the red carpet for the people who are doing the most important work in our cities? Anyone don't focus on educating the future generation? Wow. Simultaneously, we started having these conversations with all of these nonprofits um, who were underpinning the success of the school system, Teach for America, Wide Angle Youth Media, Playworks, mm -hmm. um, young audiences, right? Um, mm -hmm. That were spread out in buildings all over town in their own space, renting their own conference rooms, having their own kitchenettes with no ability to really collaborate unless it was very intentional. Mm -hmm. And so we started taking all these notes and realized that this was the beginning of what became called the Center for Educational Excellence. We wanted to find a building that could house some teachers and some nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And the 
idea was we were going to build a, we we're going to buy a little four unit kind of row home and convert those four units into apartments for teachers and keep them affordable. And we looked all over town. We looked in all of the fancy neighborhoods, the Federal Hills and the Cantons. And right. we just couldn't make any of the economics work for anything that we were trying to do, right? The, 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 the way we wanted to structure our rents to be really below market. Right. Just we couldn't, we, we couldn't make it work. Mm-hmm. And a friend of ours told us about this building on the corner of Howard and, 20, Howard and 26th Street in the neighborhood of Remington. Mm-hmm. Um, for your listeners who might not know Remington, it's where our house is, the food mm-hmm. hall. Um, mm-hmm. But at that point, most people, unless you live there, didn't really know what Remington was. Um, and so we meet the, a buddy of ours and the bank who was foreclosing on the building mm-hmm. from some fancy developer who was going to do high-end apartments or condos, which would not have worked in the neighborhood. Right. Um, and the neighborhood just kind of like pushed him out and he never got his project off the ground. So the building's sitting, it's been vacant for 30 years. Wow. It's a hundred thousand square foot collapsing old tin can manufacturing facility that was built in like 1862 or something like that. Mm. Um, all the windows are boarded up. There's trees growing out of the roof. Um, the banker and our buddy like take one look at our faces as we're getting to like ready to walk into the building for the tour. And they're like, are you sure you guys want to, right. want to go on this tour? Do you know what you're stepping into? So we go on this tour of this building and there are like pigeons or bats flying around. There are mattresses with like booze bottles and heroin needles all over the place. Oh, wow. The roof has collapsed in and like three quarters of it. And we're walking through and the bankers like looking back at us, like telling, like thinking that we're crazy. But what we were able to see Mm. through all of this mess Mm -hmm. is the beauty of the building, right? Mm. Like this was the dream that we had been looking for, the opportunity, a blank canvas um, to create this amazing space for teachers. So we get out of the tour and like we step out into the street and breath of fresh air, right? Um, and we Im- immediately start the process of building it from the inside out. We knew we were going to do this. We knew that this was going to be the building. Um, so we sent out this email to uh, probably a, a thousand teachers through our like connections and all of these programs in Baltimore saying, hey, um, we've heard that uh, there's an opportunity to create a building for you guys. Um, for those of you who are interested in helping with the planning, meet us on the corner of Howard and 26th Street. And so we show up there a couple weeks later and I was expecting several hundred teachers to show up and, and half an hour later, the last of like maybe 10 teachers trickled in. Okay. And we said, you know what? These are our 10 um, and let's awesome. roll our sleeves up and start the work. So we took them on the tour and they fell in love with it, you know? Um, and we were very clear that uh, this was their building. Our job was to help them realize their dream. And for 12 months, They designed every square inch of their apartments. They chose their own rents. They picked the amenities that they needed to succeed as teachers within the building. We did the same things with the nonprofits. All the while, we're having these like amazing groundswell with these teachers. And we're also bringing like our financial advisors and our accountants Mm -hmm. and like people that really like our wives to tour the building. Mm -hmm. And every one of them is like, you're crazy. This will never work. Like this is a terrible investment. You can't keep the rents low. Um, This isn't something you should focus on. You're going to lose everything you've ever had. Um, run away from this opportunity. Like no one's going to want to live or work in the neighborhood of Remington. This is a, this is a bad idea, but we were so driven, like in our hearts, we knew and Mm -hmm. we had seen it in the eyes of the teachers and the nonprofits who wanted to create this for themselves. And so slowly, but surely like the plan started to materialize at the same time, we started working with the community. We went to all community association meetings and we were very clear that this isn't our idea, that there are teachers and nonprofits who want to come into your neighborhood rehab this old built old building and make it a place for themselves um they want to become they want to they, they want to come in and and they want to participate in the success of this community and of course everybody loved this idea of converting this old collapsing building into a center for educational excellence but in that first community association meeting i love this um it was all like high fives and everyone was like so stoked about this right and um, one guy raises his hand and we're like, oh no, he had a very serious look on his eye. He's like, you know what? Um, this is cool, but if you rehab this building and you only allow the teachers who are living in it and the nonprofits who are working it into the building, then we as the community won't have the opportunity to participate in the success of it. Um, and it would be really cool. There's no coffee shop in this community. It'd be really cool if you took on the corner of Howard and 26th Street and you carved out a little thousand square foot space for any kind of coffee shop 
that would be really important to us. And I'm sitting here thinking, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. Okay. Howard and 26th okay. Street. Howard and 26th Street is not a street that you would walk to <laughs> right. um, at the time. Right. Right. Dark, right. collapsing buildings, boarded up houses that surrounded it. Mm-hmm. But we listened. Um, mm-hmm. And he, he was pretty funny at the end. He was like, as long as it's not a Starbucks, because if it's a Starbucks, I'm going to throw rocks through the window every Right, night. right, right. Big company, um, right? <laughs> uh, but the idea was to, you know, to, to make sure that the community knew that we were coming in as neighbors and not guests, and that this yeah. wasn't our project. It was theirs. Right. And our job was to be quietly behind the scenes, listening every step of the way, helping them, just like we were going to help the teachers and the nonprofits realize their dream through this building at least for for the dream for the building. And then we did the same thing with the team, right? Um, The team that's involved in helping to bring it to life because we didn't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, while my dad had done some development, he had never done urban infill. Mm -hmm. He had never done, fixed up a collapsing old building. We didn't know how to pay for this, right? Right, Like the total price tag for the redevelopment was $22 million, Mm -hmm. which was $14 million more than the bank debt would support. Okay. So we had this $14 million gap in the capital structure that right. we had to find a way to fill. Absolutely. And we just brought people in who like mm-hmm. specialized in that, who could get behind it, who could teach us things that we didn't know about creatively financing these kind of opportunities. Right. For really important, underappreciated parts of our, uh, of our society. And it all came together. Like miraculously, we closed financing and construction started and Nine months before we finished construction, the building was 100% leased. And by the time we finished construction, and this is like during the economic meltdown. Right. So nine months before you started construction, it was fully leased. Nine months before we finished construction. Oh, before you um, finished. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. And then when we finished construction, there Mm. was a waiting list of over 300 teachers waiting to get into the space. And the beauty of it was we never spent a dollar on marketing or advertising. Right. It it speaks to the power of building things from the inside out, right? Absolutely. It was never our project. My guess is that all these teachers who we had worked with went back to social media, which was fairly new at the time and said, hey, there's these crazy developers. We actually don't like to look at ourselves as developers, but there's these crazy developers and they're going to rehab this old building. And it's going to be really cool. They let us like lay out our own apartments and we got to choose our own rents and the amenities we picked are amazing. Oh, wow. And, um, and uh, if they're never going to pull it off, but if they do, like you got to get in line. And sure enough, like slowly but surely, like we, we, uh, we, we, we began construction. And as soon as it became, became a real project, the waiting list just started to grow. Um, so that was a really inspiring project. Um, it's and, an amazing project. It really yeah. is. It's a beautiful community project. And it's, it's so refreshing to go into that project and feel how people are enjoying it. And just even the feeling that it gives you when you walk in, uh, the different smells, the different openness. It just is a really, really amazing vibe to live and breathe um, that building. It's, it's, it's amazing. And everything you just said, you started with your end user in mind. You knew your, your target market, ideally, you know, to kind of talk business textbook here, right? So you, you, start, you had a huge vision, but you didn't say, we're going to build it and they'll come right? But you said, these are the people that we want to serve. We want to do this specifically for the teachers. And you gained their feedback. And so many times as entrepreneurs, we miss the feedback from the people that we serve. And either we're afraid to ask for it, or we forget to ask for it, or we just keep on going head down, head down, thinking everything's okay. But the power of that feedback, and you're right, it's right in front of you and it's free to gain that feedback and have that input from, from them was just genius, really genius. And you also said that some of your biggest critics were ones that were often the closest to you, right? When you took them through the tour of the building and they're like, you are crazy insane. What are you thinking? So how, do you, how did you just keep that strength going? How did you... I mean, did, did you ever have doubt is uh, my first kind of part of that question. And then how did, what kept you going through it to get to the finish line during the biggest downturn and economic downturn of, of our history? So this is a, this is a funny story about mm-hmm. our biggest critics being closest to us. My, mm-hmm. we took our wives down, my dad brought my mom and mm-hmm. I brought Lola and mm-hmm. we went for a tour. Mm-hmm. Um, and my dad drove home with my mom and she said, Donald, of all of the 
stupid things you've done throughout your life. This is the dumbest. Um, and the story goes. She's so sweet. I can't she, see her saying that. She's so sweet. <laughs> she probably, in a French accent, she probably yes. said it in a, in a, in a yes. nicer way. It sounded um, probably so beautifully when she said it. because. Her- but according to the story, she refused to sleep in the same bed with him for a week. Um, <laughs> and the beauty of it was that like once the project picked up momentum, my mom took full credit for it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love it. But look, I mean, your, your question is, is an important one, right? Mm-hmm. I never for a minute doubted from the moment I stepped into that building. Oh, you did it. And okay. I could close my eyes and literally picture the teachers in these like refinished brick walls with these massive factory windows that had been put back in, collaborating around like a copy machine, lesson, sharing lesson plans for the day, the nonprofits working with the kids coming in. Okay. From the day that that vision entered my heart for the first time, I never questioned a single decision we made or minute we spent working on it. Um, It was almost as if we had blinders on no matter how many people tried to talk us out of it, uh-huh. um, we knew that the time for the first Center for Educational Excellence had come. Wow. And there was enough groundswell behind it from the people who mattered most, who were the people that were going to live and work in it, uh-huh. and the neighbors who surrounded it. Um, and if they believed in it, then there was no stopping it. Uh Um, and I tell people that all the time, especially like young people, Uh when we are launching ideas, it is really hard, especially when we're talking about reimagining entire industries. Uh Um, and the majority of the feedback you're going to get is negative. Um, it's going to be people telling you that you can't do it. Those are important conversations to listen to. Uh Um, and you have to understand where the pushback's coming from. But you need to be able to turn that in a way that really benefits the work that you're trying to do. And so, you know, that, that, that idea, this concept of the words no and can't, which we hear all of the time. Um, if I hear 100 words in a day, 95 of them are like, no, you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I have to understand where the no and the can't come from. But those are these like incredible drivers um, and I always ask myself, what is this person missing? Why don't they see what it, what we see at this point? Right. 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 Um, and, uh, so yeah, there, there really, there, there really was never any doubt, um, That's on amazing. that project or, or any of the other ones that we've, um, well, and it's, you know, on. you, you are an incredible visionary. You're, you have that innovation in your head that you can just see it. It's almost like, it sounds like you were just manifesting that project. You, you were seeing it and living it and breathing it and living it through this, the eyes of the teachers and the community and just kept, that's what really kept pulling you through that. That's amazing. Well, yeah, thank you for saying that. We all have that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the separator is fear, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's this fear thing that comes in and it like invades our bodies. Um, yep. And it, it, it goes directly to your head, fear. Um, and it completely changes the way that we think about things. Our bodies, our physical bodies know what's right and wrong. And I get into this like internal fight all of the time. Anytime there's a decision to make, all right, let's go. Right. What is it that we're thinking about? The head's like, no, no, bad idea. Like that's never going to work. Um, and the body, the heart, knows right yeah. and 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 when you listen to that right when you're able to block out the fear then that creativity starts to explode in a completely different way yes. but our job as human beings our jobs as leaders and entrepreneurs is to block that fear to help those on our team block out that fear because with that explosion of creativity that's when all of this like magic begins to happen right absolutely absolutely and you know, it's oftentimes they say that that no is actually not yet. It doesn't mean no, but it's just not yet for some people. They just haven't gotten there. And as fearless leaders, as a fearless leader like yourself, it we don't know all the answers, but we just know that we can take somebody somewhere because we can block that fear. So when was that project complete? What was the actual completion date on that? 2009. We finished 2009. it in the summer of 2009. Wow. Oh my goodness, time is just melting by, isn't it? That seems like yesterday. 
So then um, walk us through the discovery of your next current project. How, what was the purpose behind Lexington Market and all of that and the purpose of that project? And then I want to get to your book. Yeah, thank you for asking about Lexington. Um, and uh, I'll just fill in a little bit of details in between now, those last kind of 12 years. But um, so the so first center for education was so successful um, mm -hmm. that we had to replicate that we had to replicate the model again, right? Like Teach for America mm -hmm. came to us and all of our lenders and investors, a lot of them who had doubted us in the beginning were like, hey, this is on the cover of so many like uh, magazines and oh. newspapers. And oh. like, this is the story that like we need to continue to tell. How can we do more of these? Mm -hmm. So we got invited to replicate the model across the country, um, wow. which is such a huge honor for like a tiny company to have this opportunity. So we did another one in Baltimore, a project called Union Mill in the neighborhood of Hamden. Mm -hmm. Same thing, uh, did it the same way, building it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, we went up to Philadelphia and found an amazing partner up there who looked at real estate the same way we did, not right. as a, a tool to make as much money as quickly as, a po as possible, but as a tool to empower communities. Um, and then we just started working in other communities throughout the city, listening to what it was that they needed. We've built a lot of charter schools, uh, creatively financing them and converting old factories and abandoned warehouses into ways to service kids um, in, a, in a completely different way. Um, and, have, and have done a, a number of other projects, especially in that neighborhood of Remington, where mm. we take great pride in the community kind of coming to us and asking us to be kind of like their development arm right. for any kind of projects they had. They came up with this master plan that we've been slowly but surely helping them bring to life. Right. And I don't know, two or three years ago, um, literally the night before an RFP was due for the redevelopment of Lexington Market, which wasn't even on our radar, somebody reached out and said, hey, you guys are applying for this, right? Like, this is the perfect project for you guys. Like, Baltimore needs you guys to be the developer of Lexington. Mm. And we didn't have any time to um, think about it. We quickly huddled up and we're like, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Wow. Do you remember going there as a kid? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I, in, when, I was a, when I was in high school at like 13, 14, I, was, I painted commercial painting. I, was a, I worked for a painting company and we painted Lexington Market. No. It was, it was an amazing summer. We went down there every day and it was the greatest place to people watch. Mm. Everybody from Baltimore showed up there. It was um, great. It was amazing. Uh, my dad tells stories about his dad bringing him down on a trolley. And, yeah. You know, um, you didn't start your weekend unless you had right. you know, step, set foot in Lexington. Part market. of your tradition. There's a, well, this is an off the kind of podcast story, but they have a chocolate eating contest and Sean was actually in it and won it one year. So that's a whole other story for another time. But <laughs> I love that. I love that. Oh, so you have to bring that back. You have to promise to bring that back. <laughs> We will. He's going to be our, our first guest uh, chocolate eater. <laughs> but go ahead. So, sorry. Yeah. So we got the team together and we agreed that this was the perfect project. We scrambled to submit the uh, an, applic uh, uh, an application for the RFP and right. we got a call, call back and were awarded the project. And we were very clear from the beginning um, that this isn't a real estate project, right? So I have the fortune of sitting in all these meetings throughout the city of Baltimore where mm -hmm. In all of these closed doors, everybody talks about how divided Baltimore is, mm -hmm. um, about what can we do to bridge the divides that exist in our city now more than ever. But it's all noise, right? Yep. Like I've never seen anybody like act on it in a significant way that starts to move the needle, yep. um, including myself. Of all of the things that we've tried to do, that's the one, one of the things that we haven't had success in is like really like bridging the like racial divides that exist in the city of Baltimore and the economic divides that exist. Mm -hmm. And what we realized when we began to submit the application for the RFP for Lexington was that um, it, really, uh, it really wasn't, uh, uh, the, what, what was missing from the story was a physical place to bring people together. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could step into the Lexington opportunity and not look at it as a real estate project, but look at it as an opportunity that a single building could unite a very divided city mm -hmm. in every decision that we would make every step of the way, 
would be with that as a backdrop, then that's what would propel us forward. And like we talk about leading with purpose, right? Like right. that's something that's always been important to us, whether it's our company, whether it's our own personal life or whether it's an individual pro project, every project that we take on has to have its own soul, right? It has to have its own purpose and its own mission. Um, and for us, like Lexington Market was the culmination of entire lifetime of work and learning and the yeah. opportunity to like bring it all together and building it from the inside out, making sure that not only the community and the neighborhood that surrounded the market, but that the entire city of Baltimore fell in love with Lexington, the way you just uh -huh. told me that story with your uh -huh. eyes lighting up around uh -huh. the chocolate eating contest. Uh -huh. Like everybody's got a Lexington story, but we've all kind of like given up on it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, When's the last time, I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot, but when's the last time you're down at Lexington Market? You know, like I asked people that question. So, so it's a it shell right of like its- the hippodrome, right? Is right there, is that right? The yeah. right there, yeah. yep. Um, and there is an opportunity to bring Lexington back in an incredibly inclusive way where mm -hmm. everybody in the city takes a little bit of ownership in it, um, a little bit of pride of authorship of like what it's to become. And it's been fascinating. One of the biggest things is the lack of diversity, racial diversity and representation from the black community in the vendors that exist in Lexington today. Right. Less than 5% of the vendors in Lexington today are black owned businesses. Hmm. And for a year, every night, we were in a different community, a different part of Baltimore listening, telling like the 10 minute version of the Lexington story and listening for 50 minutes around like what Baltimore wanted for the revised Lexington market. So and what are you hearing? Yeah. So um, there's basically the like, three I love things. how you described it as the soul. Yeah. So there's, there's basically three things. The first and, and the thing that we heard the most was that it, the, um, the vendors within the market need to represent the diversity of the city of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, and we just launched our first, uh, we just wrapped up our first round of our applications for the new set of vendors. We'll have 50 spaces available. Okay. And, this is launching this vendor application process in a time where the food and beverage industry is getting hit harder than it ever has. Mm -hmm. That at least 50% of all, of, of all food businesses have either gone out of business or will go out of business. Mm -hmm. And the idea of like thinking about opening a, a, a business, we're like, well, this timing was terrible. Um, but we like stayed true to our course in really believing right. that if it was done in an inclusive way, if we could build the groundswell and the love of Lexington behind it, that people would apply. Right. So at the end of September, we wrapped up our first round of applications. Okay. Um, we had over 160 applications for the 50 spots and another 180 had started the application but hadn't completed it yet. Wow. So that's like 300 and some amazing small businesses in yeah. Baltimore. Um, and what we're the most proud of is that 60% of the applicants were black, 60% of them were women-owned businesses, 15% were um, uh, immigrants, 15% were white, 50%, no, 60% were uh, business owners who lived in the city of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, and the remaining 40 were from the state of Maryland. So the narrative changed a little bit as well in that it no longer was just a place to unite Baltimore. It was an opportunity to launch and prove that a single building could be the largest launch pad and incubator for small businesses that Baltimore has ever seen. In about a year and a half, 50 brand new businesses in a time where our world needs love and passion and excitement and belief um, are gonna open their doors right. and all of Baltimore is gonna show up, right? Absolutely. Um, no, matter, no matter what story you've had in your head of how Lexington is, like you will believe in it at this point because you've had a seat at the table. And I tell, every time I get the opportunity to talk about it, I tell people, you can't sit on the sideline, right? You can't expect that somebody else is gonna do the heavy lift, mm -hmm. that somebody else is gonna do the hard work and maybe you'll show up. Mm -hmm. um, sitting on the sideline at this point in our country, in this point in our city's trajectory, is no longer an option. If you haven't found that thing that mm -hmm. propels you forward, that's outside of your comfort zone, um, uh, then you're really missing out. And so, you know, Lexington market is just, it's been amazing to see it come to life. Um, where uh, the construction's real, it's happening, have an amazing team that helped to finance it when so many people told us that it would never work. The economics wouldn't, wouldn't pencil out. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's happening. It's so interesting, you know, thinking about the Remington project and this project and the timing of both getting started 
And then, you know, you had the 2008 recession with Remington and then the COVID with Lexington. And, you know, you can never time the best time for anything, right? As we know this, whether it's, you know, you're an entrepreneur trying to take a vacation pre-COVID or you are, you know, trying to start a family or, or trying to launch a huge project or even start a business. And, but it makes you stronger. You learn so much from it. And when you hear stories of the outpour of over 300 small minority businesses showing up to say, I want to do this. I can do this. Give me a shot. And this is the perfect you know, platform. This is the soul that I want to live and breathe in. It's just, it's just a remarkable and it's amazing. Yeah. And that's round one of the applications. We have another round that starts in January of 2021 mm-hmm. and wraps up, I think, in uh, maybe April. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the expectation is that round two, there'll be even more applicants than there were, were, were in the first round. And we're, we're not just throwing out applications and receiving them. The neat thing is that, like, we've, um, we've built this incredible, like, technical assistance component behind the applications Mm -hmm. So that like every step of the way from the time you like see the application to how to fill it out, to how to like plan for your business success, to how to open, to how to succeed after Mm -hmm. having opened. Right. Um, Every step of the way, like our team has put things in place to hold the vendor's hand to make sure that they succeed um, in moving their idea forward. It's so important. It is so important. And they need that, that backbone. They need that structure. And I love how you you know, don't like to consider yourself the, the classic traditional developer. You really are a community, a community inspiration. Did you eat, ever read Blue Ocean Strategy? No, I haven't read it. Is it good? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, you know, a book, I guess it was, I read it back in 2007, probably 2006, 2007. And it just talks about you know, disrupting different, uh, different types of businesses. And, and uh, you, you really, I think you'd enjoy it. I'll pick it up. Well, speaking of books and podcasts, bring us up to date. Tell us the evolution of how all of this started with your newest, I guess, you know, joy and what you're working on. Yeah. So um, I would have the opportunity to speak a lot, right, around Uh the work we were doing, whether it was the Peace Player stuff or it was the Seawall stuff. And, you know, I've, I always talk like this around building things inside out and mm-hmm. um, uh, leading with your purpose. And mm-hmm. I'd finish these talks and people would come up and say, hey, that was such a different way to look at it. Uh, and to me, wh- 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 how else would you look at it, right? Okay. Um, how you're so wired, I, right. <laughs> so I, I started taking notes on like little stories and the notes became like chapters. And then we, I believe we all have a book in us at some point, right? If we can like unblock the fear, and we all have a book in us. Yes. And uh, and I unblocked the fear, mm-hmm. and the those notes became chapters, and those chapters became a book. Um, and so I've been working on it for four years at this point, um, and it's finished. Mm-hmm. I am about to sign up with this amazing publisher who's going to okay. help put it out throughout the world. Good. Um, the launch date is uh meant to be in the fall of 2021 okay and you know the book's called larger than yourself and what i realized throughout all of these journeys is that we were helping to take small ideas right ideas that have always existed like i said in the beginning they've been on the tip of the universe's tongue they just needed somebody to push them over the edge um and we've always realized that those ideas weren't ours and we've helped to grow them. But because we've grown them in the way that we have, mm-hmm. they've actually become movements, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so when you're able to take an idea and turn it into a movement, it exists beyond you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it grows significantly faster than you could ever grow it if you tried to force it on your own. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we noticed that that was the same thing with the peace players program, right? We started with like 10, $20,000 in the bank. It's a $3 million a year organization at this point that's worked mm-hmm. with almost a hundred thousand kids in mm-hmm. 22 countries across the planet, um, uh, on four continents. Uh, and it grew because we never claimed ownership of the idea. And we followed these like seven principles that I talk about throughout the book that helped to grow the idea. Okay. And then. The same thing with Seawall and all of these, every project that we've had um, has 
been brought to life in this inclusive way that has allowed others to have the same sense of pride of ownership and authorship in what was created uh -huh. and have allowed them to become movements. And some of them are tiny movements and some of them are larger movements and some of them are at the beginning stages of movements and some of them are at the late, late, later stages of it. But the book like kind of follows like my life mm -hmm. as it relates to these stories. And I kind of have like a, a, uh, a front seat. I try to remove myself from as much of the stories as possible mm -hmm. and tell the stories of those who have taught me along the way. Oh, wow. um, so it's a series of 21 different like inspiring stories every step of the way with these aha moments throughout that hopefully teach the reader yeah. how to grow an idea into a impactful and powerful movement. So as the book was taking shape um, and into the hands of the publishers, I wanted to continue the growth and the learning. Mm -hmm. um, I don't claim to have, be right or have any of the ideas. And I wanna always learn how others are looking at growing ideas. Mm -hmm. So we started a cool little platform called Larger Than Yourself. It's largerthanyourself.com. Awesome. And every week we release a new story, both in written word and in a podcast form around some entrepreneur, some really brave risk taker from someplace in the world mm -hmm. who has taken a small idea, led with their purpose, challenged the status quo, got out of their comfort zone, led mm -hmm. with love tackled leadership in a way that they might not have known that they were able to before right. um, and grown that idea into a movement that is improving our world in some form or fashion. Right. So it's been fascinating. Um, I am a terrible writer, which is why it's taken as long as it has. Um, but I'm both inspired and stoked for the book to come out, but equally as excited about every time I get to sit down for an hour with somebody who's literally changing our planet um, and making it a better place more united, more connected place. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it sounds like you have a second book in your future called um, Unblock the Fear, because you really speak a lot about that. And I really like the, the title of this book, Larger Than Yourself. And I feel like that's where a lot of entrepreneurs really get stuck. They have this grand vision. They can see you know, everything at the end of the path built, their company built how they want it. And sometimes they just can't get past themselves and they feel like they need, you know, a gazillion followers or a high paid team or whatever it is. But in the story of your nonprofit and, and also with one of your first projects at Seawall, you really started with 10 people, right? The 10 teachers that were there and showed up on the corner and said, let's tour the building. And then there's 10 basketball players, it sounded like, to really make yourself larger than yourself. Would you say that's kind of step one in the process? You know, how can you help business owners get past themselves? Be, so, become less of a bottleneck in their business. <laughs> so this is such a small thing, but this really bothers me, um, is that when a buddy of mine or somebody I know or somebody that I meet at a networking event hands me a business card for a company that they've just started, Right. And I take the business card and I look and it's got their name and it says president and CEO. Right. And for me, I'm like president and CEO of what? Of a one person company? Right. Like what right. kind of message are you sending to the people that are going to come in behind you? Right. The people that you're going to recruit. Like right. they are immediately employees and not team members. Right. They are immediately made to feel less than mm -hmm. that they will have a paycheck, but that this clearly isn't their idea because you have created this like, separation between uh, the founder and, and founders are important, really important. They have something that a lot of people don't have and I'm not knocking that at all. Mm -hmm. And titles become important as organizations grow. But at the early stages of the formation of a company, of the growth of an idea, mm -hmm. um, to call yourself the president and CEO of it, I feel like creates this disconnect mm -hmm. between the ability for others to love it as much as you do. Mm -hmm. And it's only when others love it as much or more than you do, then it grows beyond your ability to force it forward yourself. Right. So that's something that like I talk about when, you know, we, when, with like startup entrepreneurs who are, have something really cool um, and want to grow it, uh, mm -hmm. but might not understand how something as simple as a title on a business card might slow the growth down. 
Absolutely. Well, and it's funny, but you know, it's, it, it's interesting being a 100% woman owned minority business. My title only matters when I go to get the certifications and that's when they scrutinize you, the MDOT and the WeBank and all of that to the point where they, they question, you know, other people's titles in the organization. And it, they don't think that you have the decision-making ability if you don't throw those titles on, which is it just the same thing drives me nuts because it seems obnoxious that I have to have all of that in my signature where it's like, I always call everybody on my team, my teammate, they're never my employees, you know? Yeah. But it's like, when you go through the, when you have to go through and get all those certifications, they just feel like you have to have that label where they don't believe you. You know what I mean? That sizzle, yeah. that's my little puppy. <laughs> no, I've listened so, to a bunch of your podcasts and I love how you refer to your team. I mean, it is very clear that you have put them into a position that completely take ownership of what you guys are working on. Yeah. So I, it's what? clear in your voice, it's clear in the language, it's clear in the words yeah. that you use. It, and when you, you know, when you can grow your people and you can grow them into uh, become and, and watch their families grow along the way. Uh, it's just, I mean, that's what, that's what just kind of drives me and to, to make really awesome things happen out there for your clients and watch their families grow. And it just, you know, there's, there's just such a different, um, I think, emotional intelligence that goes along with being a business owner, especially now versus, you know, I guess back into your, your pre-2007 self, right? So what has been the thing that you've learned the most about yourself on this journey? For me, it's been the importance of leadership. Mm -hmm. I, um, in my early 20s, into my early 30s, I was very self-conscious. I never believed in myself. Mm. Um, and I never believed in my, had a hard time wrapping my head around my ability to lead others. Um, I, I think it came somewhat naturally um, as a result of how I went about it, mm -hmm. but I always doubted myself uh, in, in that growth. Um, and it's, just been a, a, a real like it's been a real opportunity to learn and and step into that that spot I've my leadership style is much more hands-off I surround myself with people who are 10 times smarter than me 10 times better at the things that we do mm -hmm. um, and I just try to like stay out of everybody's way yeah. help to provide the guidance and the vision and the passion right something that comes naturally um, but what I've realized is that you, there are serious moments where you, as a leader, you do have to step up. Um, and that's been my biggest learning those times that I haven't. Um, and I've realized that sitting on the sidelines sometimes isn't the answer. Mm -hmm. So for me, the biggest growth, the biggest struggle, the thing that I've um, uh, learned the most about is stepping into the, uh, the role as a as a leader, something that might have come nat naturally to me, but that was very uncomfortable for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and that I'm still getting comfortable with today. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, with a greater understanding of um, how to do it more effectively and efficiently, mm -hmm. it's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, just through the work that you're doing with Larger Than Yourself, you can see and feel just how much you've grown over the past uh, couple of years, which is awesome. I cannot wait to read the book. I can't mm -hmm. wait at all. Um, so are you a, a book reader? Are you a business book reader? Pardon Sizzle, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> yes, I love upstairs. reading. I love reading. Okay, tell us some yeah. of your favorites. <sighs> so the greatest book ever written is called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Okay. Um, it's actually a Br Brazilian guy. Okay. Um, and fascinating story about a boy, uh, his journey, um, finding love. Um, but it's a, it's a real um, life book. Um, you know, t total fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. But I probably read that book once or twice a year just to kind of reground myself. Um, and then I, I love biographies, autobiographies, you yes. know, like Nelson Mandela's, I'm a big Che Guevara guy. Um, there's a book by D. Hawk, who's the founder of Visa called One for Many, okay. which is one of the greatest books I've ever read. 
we know so little about the little plastic credit card and its history. And right. but Visa is the largest uh, company on the planet, I believe. Um, wow. And it's just kind of quietly in your wallet. Mm -hmm. based on like how they brought it to life and the like network of connections that were created where you don't even think about it mm -hmm. um, and you don't need to think about it. So yeah, I love that. That's reading. great. That's great. And uh, what other podcasts do you like? I know that I'm going to drop in the notes, the link to yours. It's fabulous. Um, tell me some other ones that you like out there. Are you a podcast mm -hmm. listener? I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. I, yeah. I, I've, I listen to those that my friends recommend. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I've, got I've been listening to a bunch of yours recently since oh. I knew we were going to hang my awesome. buddy, Joe McClensky has got one that I, that I tune into. Um, yeah, it's, it's mostly ones that my friends do. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of them to learn how other people are going about Absolutely. To tell stories. Are you enjoying the platform? Isn't it fun? It's fun. Yeah. And I, I, I selfishly, if no one listened to my podcast, I get an hour uninterrupted with a hero of mine or something right. that's changing the world. And if nothing else comes of it, right. at least I got the download for that time. Oh, I know. That's what I think I love the most. It's like, I didn't know this much about you ever. And we got a chance to really just kind of hear all the stories. I mean, that's what gives me fuel also. It just, it keeps you going because we care. We really care as entrepreneurs and leaders. We simply care. And I, and that passion of making the impact and building the community and making sure that, you know, the families out there of all different shapes and sizes are really, um, enjoying life and being good people and um, coming together is just so powerful. So what do you think is the expected open time on Lexington Market? When are we going to have the chocolate eating contest? Yes, the chocolate <laughs> eating contest, make sure you tell Sean, is scheduled for Q1 of 2022. Awesome. I love it. He's got some time it. to practice. Oh my goodness. Yeah. He has a whole strategy. He like grows a beard because you, you can't use your hands. So it's like, I think it was like a chocolate strawberry on a stand and then like a cupcake and then like a chocolate cake and then something else. And you go up against another player and basically you just can't use your hands, but you just kind of go at it. And it was on the radio and everything. It's a big deal. <laughs> I love it. Well, I can't thank you enough, Tebow, for being here today. You are an amazing leader and you are continuing to do amazing things out there. I can't wait to read your book. Uh, thank you for everything that you do for our community in Baltimore and um, say hello to your family. And thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for hosting these conversations. Thank you for including me in it. It's been a, been a real blast hanging out. Absolutely. Thanks. Bye-bye. See ya. Wow, what an episode. Did you learn something new? I hope so. I am so happy you were able to be here with us today. I'd love to hear from you. Leave me a review and I will be sure to read it and respond to you. Also, if you'd like to email me, my email address is urock at iEvolveConsulting.com. Hit subscribe and every Tuesday you'll get notification when the next episode drops. We really have some amazing interviews and tips in the future. Anything you need, I'm here for you. I want you to keep your momentum. I want to help you stay accountable. I want you to stay inspired. I want you to evolve. So please let me know what you need and I'd love to hear from you. Take care until next time.